All right. A pleasant evening to everyone. Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, from those who came back from the lecture yesterday. Uh, well, and to those who are here for the first time, welcome. Welcome to Post Down Landscapes, uh, space sharing in the emerging order. Uh, this uh, lecture series is brought to you by the Philippine Association of Landscape Architects uh, in cooperation with uh, research and the Research and Extension Program and the Envi Environmental Design Studio Laboratory of the UP College of Architecture. Uh, I'm Baldi, by the way. Uh, I am a landscape architect and also a member of TALA. Uh, the, uh, this lecture series, uh, this two part, this three part lecture series is part is part of Focal Point, which is the online discussion series of PALA which discusses about landscape architecture and uh, how and, and other related topics, right? You can learn more, if you wanna learn more about Focal Point, you can go to the FB page of the Philippine Association of Landscape Architects to learn more. Uh, I repeat, the Facebook page of, of our comp of PALA is Philippine Association of Landscape Architects. Speaking of which, uh, we are live streaming. We are live streaming at Facebook. We are live streaming at the Facebook page, and also we are live streaming in YouTube. Uh, if you want to search and watch uh, this live stream in YouTube, you can just type in "post lockdown landscapes pala," and you'll find our live stream there. All right, this is part two of three of a three-part series, as I've mentioned. Uh, of how landscape architects face the challenges, the current challenges presented by these, by this new normal, or what we'd like to call uh, the emerging order. Yesterday, we had uh, Dr. Vergara to discuss on how to discuss about ecological landscapes in terms of uh, the COVID-19. Yes, and yesterday we had concluded that data data is indeed very vital very vital in designing we can it's better to have a data driven design than to design uh, uh, arbitrarily all right uh, shout out to all the sesam people in the in the chat right now uh, also to all our the pala members welcome to the live stream all right so yeah, as I mentioned yesterday, Dr. Vegara presented, and today we're going to have a another researcher, an esteemed, uh, not researcher, our speaker, an esteemed speaker in the, from the field of medicine, uh, or rather, they're in the field of public health. All right, but 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 before we introduce the speaker, I have a few reminders for you all. First, uh, if you are one of those who who are requesting for a certificate of participation. You might want to answer the feedback form after this lecture series, so which is a prerequisite for us for you to receive this certificate. Uh, also, make sure that you have pre-registered for this lecture series before you can, so that you can receive the certificate. Take note that uh, the day three uh, lecture, the registration for that would still is still open. So. Uh, to, today's your last chance. So if you want to take have a certificate for tomorrow. And then uh, also uh, we'd like to iterate that the op that uh, the views and opinions presented by the lecturer are his or his or her own and does not necessarily reflect that the views and opinions of Pala as a whole as a whole. Okay. Uh, later on after the uh, speaker's lecture, we're going to be discuss, we're going to have a question and answer uh, portion, an open forum, if you may. Uh, you to, if you have any questions, you can type it in in the chat in both Facebook Live and in the live chat feature of, of YouTube. All right. Um, and, be, and in addition to that, we're later, we're going to have two guest uh, reactors who will give their thoughts and insights in the regarding the topic so that they can help uh, catalyze our minds catalyze our our how we can relate this uh, topic of public health with landscape architecture all right now for our our second lecture for this three-part series 
he is a professor of microbiology. He is also firm, formerly the uh, UP uh, faculty regent. He's the former director of the National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology from UP Visayas. He is also a, this is also his second stint as the chair of the Division of Bi Biological Studies in the College of Arts and Science in UP Visayas. He is a graduate of BS Biology. He, he is a cum laude from UP Visayas. He, is, he took his medicine uh, degree from the UP College of Medicine. And he took his PhD in medical science major in bacteriology from the Nagasaki University Institute of Tropical Medicine. To add, he is also the post postdoc research fellow majoring in biochemistry and cell biology at the pulmonary critical care core care medicine branch at the National Institute of Health in Maryland, USA. He is an active member of several uh, several uh, organizations. He is part of the Philippine Society for Cell Biology. He is part of the Philippine Society for the Advancement of Genetics, Philippine Society for Microbiology, where he is also the former a former president of the Visayas chapter. He is also an elected member of the Philippine Aca Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, where he serves as a board member. Some of his current partners in the field of public health include the DOH, the DSWD, the Union of Foundation, and even the Office of the Vice President. And because of these partnerships and his programs with them, he has attained these 2017 UP Gawad Pangulo Awards for excellence in public service. Everyone, please give a round of applause for Dr. Philip Ian Padilla. Hello, thank you, Baldi, for the introduction. Uh, so can I slide share now? Can you see the slide, Baldi? Is the slide okay? Hello? Is the slide okay, Baldi? Yes, sir. Uh, we can we can see these slides. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Pala for the invitation to speak to you tonight. Uh, I'll basically talk about uh, COVID-19 and what I think are the implications in the field of architecture in terms of open spaces. Uh, I'm predominantly a public health uh, person, a scientist, so my point of view mainly relies on the public health point of view of uh, how the epidemic is being spread and how public spaces can be rearranged or modified. So the title of the talk is COVID-19, Public Health and Open Spaces. Uh, as an as a, uh, introduction, just to give the numbers and give you an overview of what's happening now with COVID-19 around the world, according to the WHO, the numbers have been steadily increasing. Uh, as of yesterday, there are around uh, almost 200,000 Case, new cases of COVID-19 around the world, and it affects almost all countries. Uh, the confirmed cases as of yesterday had a total of around 14.5 million and the death of around half a million, 607,000. So it's readily uh, very infectious, but the death rate is quite low, uh, hovering around less than 4 to 3%. Uh, if you look at now the, the actual numbers, you can see that the graph is gradually increasing. The slope is uh, not as steep uh, compared to other countries if you give the mean for around the world. And of course, the deaths were really uh, a lot 
during the beginning of the epidemic because the hospitals and the doctors didn't know how to manage the infection yet. And gradually... Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah, sir, yes. I believe these uh, these slides aren't moving. Oh, okay. Nagmumove na ba? Uh, no, sir. Right. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, all right. Uh, ayan, yeah. sir. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay, there. Right. Uh, is that Carry okay? on. Yeah. So uh, that's the number of cases. And if you move it to the different uh, regions around the world, uh, the highest number of cases, new cases especially, yeah. come from the United States, the Americas, uh, the whole of the northern part of the North America from Mexico to Canada. But most of the cases are really coming from the USA. Uh, the second one would be Europe, which were hardest hit at the start of the epidemic. And third is our region here in Southeast Asia with around 1.5 million cases. Uh, if you look at the Philippines, uh, we, have a, we have a certain bend curve. So the steep, the, the, the curve has a little bit flattened. We want it to be zero. But as of the past month or the past three weeks, there has been a surge. We, I'm, I'm not calling it a second wave. It's still a continuation of the first wave. And this is mainly a result of the increase uh, OFWs and LSIs that have been coming home to the Philippines, spiking it and together with it also some local transmission, especially in metropolitan areas like Manila and Cebu. Excuse me, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I think the people are requesting to full screen the uh, PowerPoint, just press F5. Okay. If you yes, could. okay. All right. Hey, Ayan, can you see it? Wait, uh, I don't think it's working. Wait, uh, have you pressed full screen already, sir? Yes, it's full screen in my laptop. Okay, uh, it's not showing in the live stream. All right, uh, apologies again for the technical difficulties, everyone. We are optimizing the display for your viewing pleasure. Okay, how about that? Uh, not yet. I will, uh, never mind, sir. Uh, I guess we'll just carry on. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I keep clicking the, the presenter view, it's there, but uh, apparently it doesn't translate. But anyway, uh, uh, we'll just continue. Uh, just to give you an overview of what's happening in the other parts of the Philippines, because what I've showed here is the national average, and most of it, most of the data are coming from Metro Manila. But if we get a local picture of what's happening here in Western Visayas, as you can see, the curve is a little, it's not a little, but it's really flattened. Uh, we have very few local uh, transmission of the infection here in Western Visayas that comprises uh, Negros Occidental, Iloilo, Capiz, Atlan, and Antique. But lately, there has been again a spike of the number of cases. So the total now is around... Um, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, around 590 plus as of last week. And most of it are locally stranded individuals and uh, returning overseas Filipinos uh, from other countries like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Hong Kong, and some parts of Europe. So you can also see the effect of the quarantine measure. Although the we are now in modified GCQ, the spike has been Notice, noticeably high because of the repatriation policy of the national government wherein the, all the LSIs and OFWs are being repatriated back to their respective provinces. Now, having said that, uh, how is the virus? How is the virus that causes COVID-19 most commonly transmitted between people? So what we want to show here is that COVID can be minimized in terms of transmission uh, it can be directly transmitted from people to people, uh, but it can also be indirectly transmitted, especially 
uh, objects, uh, frequently uh, touched objects, doorknobs, uh, ATM machines, uh, stair, uh, uh, stairwells, uh, windows. Yeah, and this is called in, in public health home mic transmission. So it's the virus is present in an inanimate object and it's being transmitted from one person to the other, especially uh, with the manipulation of the hand. But more importantly, close contact with infected people via mouth and the nose, especially secretions from the saliva, uh, respiratory secretions from your throat, from your trachea, and other secretions that contribute not only uh, from the pharynx or the larynx, but also from the nasal passages. They're released through the mouth or the nose from the infected person, especially if the person coughs, coughs sneezes, speaks, or sings. So as you can see, uh, most of us also are faculty members, our teachers. Uh, the teacher is very uh, is con is uh, positive for the virus. It, he or she can easily transmit it to the whole class, especially without uh, social distancing. And the ratio now of one to thirty-five in one room is very uh, conducive for transmission of COVID-19. Uh, this is from the WHO. And their recommendation is that one meter per person in between person is the recommended distance when two people are talking or two people are interacting with each other. Uh, we should also clean our hands frequently, cover our mouth with tissue or elbow when sneezing or coughing. And of course, the most important part is physical distancing, which is one meter or more away from each other. If it's not possible, yes. Sir, uh, I believe the slide isn't moving again. Ah, uh, it's still the same slide. Can you see it? Yes, sir. It's still in slide 18. Okay, now it's now in slide 20. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, yeah, thank so, you, sir. Uh, can you see it there? Uh, yeah. Okay. See you. And lastly, of course, I'd like to emphasize uh, physical distancing, standing one meter or more away. Uh, if it's not possible, of course, we have to wear our masks. Uh, to prevent or give a barrier to how the virus is going to be transmitted from person to person. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. so this is the, the, the kind of picture that we would like to emphasize in terms of COVID transmission. Uh, there is direct droplet route, which is uh, transmitted by medium or large particles when one person sneezes or talks. So the closer you are, in the, the more uh, proximal you are or the nearer you are to that person who's infected, the more likely you're going to inhale the droplet or the aerosol. Of course, I mentioned about fomite route when hands are being uh, passed, when the virus is being passed around from surface to surface. And of course, there's a debate now if there's a long range airborne route that WHO is trying to see. Uh, as of now, science doesn't support or there are very few data in terms of looking at the long-term uh, or the long-range transmission of the virus from person to person. But as of now, as I mentioned before, one meter is the WHO suggested uh, distance. But the Center for Disease Control of the United States have a, a larger number they want to, they are advising that it's uh, supposed to be six feet, which is uh, twice or thrice the uh, one meter uh, recommendation of the WHO. So just to summarize, uh, you are highly susceptible to COVID transmission if you are very near each other. If you have contact with the body fluid of the infected person, it could be from the droplet or it could be the virus from the droplet that has uh, settled in the surface, which is a fomite, and there's a very high likely, highly uh, possible transmission even if you're far away. So there are, because of the presence of the aerosol within the air, so the distance there, the further you are, the better you are, or the safer you are from the transmission of the virus. Uh, if you compare COVID-19 with other, uh, with its related, uh, 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 with a related virus, with a related virus, uh, as we know, it's related to SARS-CoV. Uh, it got its name because they are both coronaviruses. Uh, SARS-CoV is actually also, uh, can be transmitted very 
in a very far distance because of the drop that nuclei around uh, here they say it's about 10 meters but the of course the the, the probability decreases but for enco or the novel coronavirus 2019 we still don't know if the long range part is very effective or uh, if the further you are and the aerosols are there if really it can be transmitted okay so uh, according to several papers, and this is just to highlight one, uh, the incidence and mortality based on the social distancing score, there are lots of papers that document that the further you are or the more people practicing in a community for uh, with social distancing, the lesser the mortality and the lesser the incidence rate of COVID-19. Uh, however, uh, this is a preprint. It's not yet peer-reviewed but they made it available because they think it's an important data that countries and other public health experts should look into uh, when doing social distancing, uh, washing of hands, and other public health measures in order to decrease the transmission. Uh, here is the incidence and mortality score based, uh, sorry, the incidence and mortality rates based on the social distancing score. So as you can see, incidence is the number of cases per unit of time and mortality is of course the number of deaths per unit of time if we uh, uh, put it as a one unit increase in objective social distancing score the relative risk of getting uh, COVID-19 has decreased from 1 to 0.7 the incidence rate and mortality has uh, almost cut into a third which is 0.65 uh, or translates to around 65 percent so that means that the social distancing, the more people socially or physically, physically distance, the more likely that they will, that that particular country will have a decreased incidence of COVID-19 and also uh, consequently decrease the mortality rate for that particular community or country that practices physical distancing. Uh, so uh, if you roam around cities now and other communities, you see lots of signs that uh, emphasize uh, social distancing. And as I mentioned, one meter is recommended by WHO. Now, what is the implication in terms of going into open spaces, parks, recreation places in which people exercise and mingle and socially interact? Uh, I looked at some papers and uh, uh, some websites, and I found the slides, the following slides to be the recommendation and in which I agree because the basis for that are all, are all uh, because of the social distancing papers that have been published recently. Uh, potential risk of crowding in parks in Milan, Italy. This is a map of Milan. They look at the number of parks and in relation to the urban density within Milan. Uh, Milan is around uh, more than half a million in terms of population. And they calculated that 38% of public parks are potentially affected by the crowding risk. So because the parks are few in number and they are uh, concentrated in very uh, dense urban areas, if people want to go out and do exercise or do recreational work, they found that uh, a third would be susceptible, a third of those parks would be susceptible or would become a good milieu or environment for people to become infected. So what do we do? What particular measures are we supposed to do in order to decrease uh, transmission rates among communities, especially in open parks? Uh, of course, uh, in the United States, uh, trails, uh, walking trails, jogging trails, are very common in the United States. Uh, there are also a lot here in the Philippines, but most of it are unpaid. Uh, so the recommendation of several papers show that these particular uh, trails would, should be widened to accommodate the one meter distance from one lane to another. So I, I'm not sure of the exact uh, dimension of this uh, uh, walkway, but uh, the recommendation is to uh, increase it by a third in order for the those that are traveling would have more physical distance when they are jogging, walking, or doing biking. Another recommendation from the uh, United Kingdom this time in England, so even uh, sidewalks have been 
um, demarcated so that the persons traveling uh, within that particular sidewalk are two meters apart so that they also become more so, so that they are less susceptible to be infected and less transmission will occur with COVID-19. So uh, I guess the first two slides show that walkways, trails, or even sidewalks in urban areas need to be redesigned or increase in terms of uh, uh, increase in terms of width in order to accommodate the two the one meter distance as recommended by WHO. Uh, even bike lanes uh, in the United Kingdom, they reallocated road space for walking and cycling. So the roads have become narrower, and instead they gave uh, uh, they widen the pedestrian lane and the sidewalk and give extra space both for the pedestrian and for the cyclists in order to again uh, encourage people to do physical or social distancing. Uh, in next slide, um, uh, in parks, uh, I got this picture from a United States major city. I think this is in Louisiana. Uh, one other recommendation in order to really decrease transmission in open areas or in recreational parks is the concept of increasing loops around walkways or around uh, uh, side streets that line the natural park. So that if, for example, a person could have alternatives of going, uh, instead of going straight, they could have uh, turned left or right, depending on the particular route and still end up in the same destination, which is the end of the trail. But it lessens congestion in certain areas of the loop. The more loops you have, the better and uh, less transmission will occur. Uh, so here, the numbers, are. this is an example of the park, and it identifies certain typical issues with uh, potential interventions that could be considered so that there will be safer levels of social distancing within parks and green spaces. For number one here, and uh, number two, it's mainly for the footways, so they need to be uh, widened in order to accommodate the people. Uh, three and four, where is three and four? Uh, the three and four are mainly the parking here, uh, the main road, so that there needs to be regulated traffic so that people will not converge in one particular area. Number five, I saw number five here, pedestrian areas need also be to be strate strategically located so that uh, there is uh, maximum social distancing within the people that patronize the park. Uh, there should be minimum pinch points, okay? So again, more access, more uh, walkways to one particular area of the park. Uh, number eight is to lessen also the queues. Uh, as you can see now, there are lots of queues in banks, uh, business establishments, and that is very, again, conducive to transmission of COVID-19. So in parks, we have to lessen the queues by making more in entrances and making those entrances one ways, and there's only uh, several exits as well. So there is uh, a one-way flow of people, so there, there is a decreased transmission of COVID-19. Uh, another recommendation is for vantage points. So usually in parks, in very big uh, cities with good overviews, uh, with good uh, scenic views, they provide uh, areas, uh, elevated areas, where you can see the entire city, for example, uh, the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. This is the picture from Greece, where you can see Athens. So now with COVID-19, you need to increase more of these spaces so that people can be accommodated and they should be able to practice uh, social distancing by being far apart from each other as well. So if this same number of people are here, uh, we need to accommodate them by building another vantage point that is also strategically located so that they can see or have access to that point of view as well compared to one group of people in this vantage point going into another. Uh, the second one, uh, the, the next point is that uh, concert halls 
in plazas and parks. Uh, this picture was taken in the United States. You need to redesign this so that there are more open spaces and put the audience uh, strategically in different angles so that they can also appreciate what's going on in the main stage uh, compared to other people sitting in another part of the park. So for example, uh, they get rid of these uh, ramps, et cetera, so that people can be accommodated here uh, and put more uh, chairs or accommodate more people on the side of, this, of the concert hall so that they also have access in terms of appreciating and looking at the main concert hall. Of course, uh, you can also expand the whole uh, park if, if the city government will allow you, but the design itself should conform to having more people being accommodated with uh, practicing social distancing. So here's another example, just another view of uh, the previous slide. So this is the main stage. So you need to expand the flat area of the park so that more people will have access and they are also one meter, one meter apart each. Uh, this is a picture of outdoor cafes in uh, one European nation. So because of the crowding in inside uh, of restaurants in businesses or hospitality businesses, uh, one suggestion is for increased outdoor sitting for restaurants and that entails also planning with the city government or the local government in terms of safety for those who are dining outside and for increasing the space, uh, uh, not just increasing in a small way or a small distance, but uh, really expanding the sidewalk so that more people can be accommodated with tables and chairs far apart from each other in order to decrease the transmission. Uh, another point, uh, also when you look at open spaces in recreational parks, uh, you need to th we need to think about uh, sanit uh, uh, hand sanitizers that are strategically placed. So in this picture, uh, uh, a local government person put a hand sanitizer and taped it in post in one of the parks. Of course, you can have also high-tech dispensers instead of this local one that is taped. You can have uh, high-tech dispensers, uh, especially in open areas like the wharf or the harbor. Uh, so here, they automatically dispense this, the hand sanitizer. It's a hand sanitizing station. Of course, it's portable and it can be moved anywhere, but it has to be strategically placed where people have access to it. Uh, additionally, uh, public toilets have to be redesigned so that they are bigger in space and uh, for lots of people to be accommodated within it that they can also practice physical distancing. So uh, the, the, the total area might change with the new normal and uh, even the design wherein, uh, where it is placed in a particular corner or which part of the park it is placed is crucial in order to determine or in order to lessen uh, COVID-19 transmission. Uh, additionally, uh, hand washing stations, which are crucial again, are also uh, very important in terms of where it should be, where it should be placed in a particular park or recreational uh, place, what kind of uh, uh, hand washing station will there be? Uh, does the community have access to clean water uh, through a pipe? Should it be put in a, in a pail that will readily dispense water? What will happen if the pail uh, runs out of water? Uh, what happens if this particular community, for example, doesn't have enough supply of water? Where will they get it? Who will refill it? And where do you place it? So these are important questions, especially in the Philippines, because uh, we are uh, problematic in terms of finances. And in a large swath of the Philippines, uh, clean water is still not accessible to our fellow Filipinos. And uh, this is already the last slide. So there are uh, more high-tech uh, portable hand washing 
stations that are situated, of course, these are examples from Western countries. They are situated in different parts in the sidewalk. They are high tech. They have enough supply of water. They are connected to the water supply of the system and they are readily acceptable for the people. So again, if we are going forward with this new normal, these hand washing stations should be very prominent. They should be more in number and strategically placed. Uh, so just to conclude uh, this particular talk, uh, just to summarize it, COVID-19 has been uh, ravaging the world and uh, the Philippines among Southeast Asian nations have been seeing a particular surge uh, of this particular infection. And we need to observe the three pillars of the WHO that they recommend for decreased transmission of COVID-19, frequent hand washing, wearing of a face protected pr protective garment or face mask. And lastly, the most important is physical distancing or social distancing so that we decrease the transmission from person to person in terms of droplet nuclei and aerosol. So the implication of that for our techs, for open spaces in terms of design, in terms of planning in the urban setting, we have to keep those in mind in order for us to maintain physical and social distancing as well as observe frequent hand washing uh, if we are not able to find or find ways in order to address that three particular parts or triad of uh, WHO recommendation, the, the COVID-19 will continue to increase uh, pending uh, uh, availability of a vaccine. So thank you very much, that's it. Thank you so much, Sir Padilla. Thank, thank you so you. much, Sir Padilla, rather. <laughs> All right, that was a very, very insightful lecture from you, sir. And right now, as a landscape architect, my mind is brimming, uh, overflowing with ideas, especially because you presented a lot of examples, uh, concrete examples of how to incorporate uh, public health uh, concepts into landscape design. And we really appreciate you for that, sir. Thank you. All right, and I, like I said, I'm really, I'm really brimming with ideas and I have lots of questions and I'm pretty sure the audience has to, but in case the, in case you still want to, synthesize it a bit. Uh, we have two uh, researchers with us, uh, two reactors rather with us today to help us uh, wrap our minds around what we have just discussed, what we have just listened to in Sir Padilla's lecture. So we have two reactors. The first one is uh, Dr. Susan Aquino Ong. She is a member of the PALA and uh, PALA Council of Fellows. Uh, hello, Dr. Uh, Susan. Nice to have you here. Right. Uh, good, good evening. Good evening, Bobby. And thank you very much, Dr. Padilla, for your insights and for your well-updated research. Um, congratulations, Pala, for this second uh, series of your three talks. Um, yeah, I, I would like, of course, I'm very grateful again to Dr. Padilla, I would like to emphasize that, for his time and for his generous sharing of research. You know that the Philippines is endowed with both natural resources as well as natural disasters. What you dealt with in your uh, slides were different areas in the world, kasi pandemic na, but I'd like to focus on the tropical setting, which by the way, I heard that that was, was one of your specialty. And the Philippines is under a tropical uh, climate or tropical zone. And so, and also everyone knows in the Philippines that we are archipelagic as a nation, which means we are separated by waters and we are an island nation well, made up of 7,000 uh, islands, more than 7,000 islands, which means could, uh, if I pose a question, would that have a bearing on the spread of of the mitigating the spread of of COVID nineteen or any other virus, uh, but you your talk focused on public parks, which is actually um, urban areas, highly dense areas like NCR or National Capital Region, uh, specifically Quezon City and Manila, 
are are on the top of list of of COVID nineteen uh, incidents. And of course, Cebu. Uh, these are and Davao, and these are cities that are highly dense. And therefore, your recommendation for the three major steps or or triad of of your uh, solution, like hand washing, face mask, and the, uh, the other one, um, social distancing was your uh, emphasis for public parks and adding more space to or widening of uh, pathways and putting our more loops and encouraging one-way flow of people, which is not, of course, natural. Um, I'd like to quote, so those are very helpful tips. And as uh, Bobby said, his mind as a young landscape architect is already beaming with a lot of ideas. And you have actually uh, set the goal, no? You, you have uh, uh, done your goal by making this young landscape architects uh, become stimulated what uh, possibilities could come into their design. And, and that I think I sh that is commendable, very commendable. Um, if the audience, most of us are with the landscape architects, others, is familiar with Ian McCard. Ian McCard's book is the Bible of Landscape Architects. It's called Design with Nature. So I'm going back to the tropical setting wherein the Philippines is windblown. It's not only... Uh, rich in natural resources is very rich in natural disasters which means we have uh eruption of taal ash falls uh we have not really investigated if those ash falls would have mitigated or hastened spreading of virus that's probably one area of study and also our um our our typhoons which frequents as strong typhoons an average of 21 Per year, on the average, just the strong typhoons, ah, yung mga mala milenyo at um, Frank, meron yatang ano doon sa bandang Visayas na Frank, na, na bagyo in the past that was very strong. So Frank is the next speaker. <laughs> and um, I do not know if that was investigated to be um, uh, a factor in uh, mitigating, lessening, or slowing down uh, spread of of virus in the country um, other things like um, is it an advantage this island being an island nation is that an advantage or not uh, of course we've heard that Sikihor is COVID free as I've heard in some islands which is these are the beautiful islands you have but still uh, adopting your recommendation and the recommendation of who in the design of landscape uh, architects and architects is imperative no uh whether you have covid 19 occurring in an island or not you should assume that may, that, that may occur because uh, as i said every 100 years that is an occurrence in the natural or evolutionary setting so we might have to think of it that way of course not everybody will live up to 100 uh but we have to think of the future and um, yeah, yun na lang po muna ngayong gabi. I think I've used up my five minutes. That's what um, James told me. I have. I, otherwise, I will keep on talking, so I have to restrain myself. And thank you very much again, Dr. Padilla. Thank you, Balbi. The floor is na the next uh, part of this program would be for the next uh, reactor. Thank you very much for this chance. Thank you, Doc Susan, for your uh, wonderful reaction, and I agree with all of your points. Um, okay, so <laughs> next topic, yeah, uh, <laughs> well, maybe later we can discuss a bit more. Anyway, uh, yeah. thank you, Doc. All right, uh, so before we get on to the second reactor, I would like to remind everyone, uh, especially those who wish to receive a certificate of participation from the for this webinar, uh, Please fill out the feedback form, which is posted in the comments section. You can just check it out. I think it was posted by Joshua Ting. And after that, and that, and you, yeah, you can fill it out. And if you wish to have another certificate of participation for tomorrow, day three, uh, you can fill out. You can pre-reg. Uh, 
I think yeah, they're, I think they're gonna post it later on. All right. Anyway, so uh, for the next uh, for the next uh, reactor, we have uh, Franklin, Mr. Franklin Fontanaza. He's also a landscape architect, a member of PALA, and he is also the for a former assistant vice president for external affairs. To add, he is also a member, uh, key member of uh, the research and extension and the environmental studio design laboratory of the UP College of Architecture. Uh, for his reaction, please welcome Mr. Franklin Pontanoza. Uh, hi, Baldi. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good evening to everybody, and uh, we hope that you're um, enjoying and learning a lot from our uh, discussion here with uh, Pala. Um, so just a, a quick reaction no, for, for tonight's speaker. Um, he, Dr. Padilla, we would like to thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, to hear from you and to learn from you. Uh, he, Dr. Padilla has been stressing about uh, the importance of all these uh, uh, measures that we should be following. Um, he mentioned about initially in his in his earlier slides. He mentioned about uh, 14 million uh, people have already got, got gotten the the virus, but we still have a very low mortality in mortality rate in in comparison to other viruses. But I believe that this does not excuse us from you know from going outside and spending more time. Uh, or not following strict uh, health measures. Sometimes we tend to forget uh, that since we're already in, in GCQ, um, we tend to forget that it's okay, we can go out, uh, we can spend more time outdoors, uh, we can dine out, something like that. So I think we have to remind ourselves that we are still in this um, pandemic and it's not really... Uh, a reason this time to, to, to just go out. So I think this particular um, talk done by Dr. Padilla, he constantly reminds us that uh, the physical distancing, the washing of hands, uh, the limited time outdoors, um, this is all backed up by science. So this is not just something that the doctors con concocted this is has some. This is something to do with studying other countries and how they dealt with the pandemic, etc. So, I I I I was kind of um, amused seeing a, a hand sanitizer attached to to a pole. So I think uh, I haven't seen that here um, specifically, but um, the the use of the hand sanitizers, especially as you enter through the malls and all these public spaces. Uh, has been very much practiced here in in the or, in urban areas. So, um, I also uh, are uh, I'm happy and uh, I'm thankful rather that we uh, as professionals or as landscape architects we are reminded that the design that we do in these open spaces have an impact to to a lot of people. Um, Maybe back then when we just designed uh, a walkway that is like two meters apart, we were just thinking of um, carrying capacity or uh, perhaps um, just more people using the space. But now we are thinking differently on how our designs could impact post-COVID uh, or post-pandemic use. So interestingly, uh, Dr. Padilla has showed several images um, for example, the bike lanes here in the Philipp here in, in Metro Manila, we are not quite uh, there yet when it comes to these bike lanes. Um, but the, I, I have um, a lot of friends who are into biking and they've been traveling EDSA uh, in their bikes. And all the more that these um, design um, strategies would be useful in this time of the uh, pandemic. Um, there's also the, the use of um, alternative or alternate walkways. Sometimes we just think of um, maybe just designing it uh, because of a certain element, 
But in the end, now that we are in the pandemic, we're actually using alternative or alternate routes differently and for a different purpose. Uh, so I think this particular pandemic has uh, opened our eyes to see design differently, especially post-pandemic. Uh, um, last, I would just like to, to give a special shout out to this. There is this um, newly graduated landscape architect who, who just passed the board. And she asked me sometime within this period of the pandemic that she asked if, if what, what were my thoughts about um, her using uh, the open space, uh, studying the open space post COVID pandemic. Um, and I think she's trying to use this particular topic for a possible graduate thesis in the future. Um, I, 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 with, with, with this particular um, interaction with this landscape architect, I realized that us professionals in the design and built environment, we're now thinking of what will happen next, what will be in the future, uh, how, will, how will the seniors use our spaces? How will the uh, common people use these spaces? Uh, so I think it's very interesting that now people and design professionals are actually considering what will happen next. So um, I think with, with this particular webinar or particular talk that we had tonight, um, we have learned a lot of certain design guidelines or design strategies that we can use in the future and hopefully after the pandemic we can we can all enjoy our public spaces again uh and and hope that you know uh we can we can go back to at least some sense of normalcy but hopefully just making sure that the strict health protocols such as social distancing hand washing are still all in place thank you Thank you so much, Sir Franklin, for your wonderful insights. And I believe your a your thesis is on public health, right? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so I I would uh, so yeah. Uh, my my recent thesis actually dealt with uh, um, indoor green open spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, Dr. Padilla even mentioned about these open spaces as a as venues where where people pub, where the public use it as uh, for physical activities or recreation activities. So that, that that's how somehow where my the graduate thesis uh, came in. We're in uh, since our open spaces are quite limited and the quality somehow is a bit diminishing. Um, we here especially in urban areas we are now open up to the option of having a fitness gym as an alternative venue for, for these physical spaces. So I wondered if what if we bring in an indoor green space inside these fitness spaces, what will happen? Uh, will, will they be, will the respondents feel that they, they are enjoying it more? Will, will they be uh, motivated to exercise more? Will they enjoy the additional oxygen, something like that? So um, I, I, with the help of my thesis advisor, Dr. Napi Navarra, who is currently the president of uh, PALA, um, and with all the help of the faculty for, for, from the UP College of Architecture, we were able to find out, and thankfully, we got a positive response from our, uh, from our respondents, rather, that they, they, they think that these indoor spaces, that these uh, facilities can actually be designed uh, with biophilic designs and in their green spaces. So I think uh, it's it's I think it's just I think it's quite timely. I think that uh, we are very much reinforced to think of what will happen if we have these in their green spaces around us and how we will benefit from it. So yeah. all, right. all right, thank you, sir Frank. Sir, uh, Dr. Padilla, uh, you've heard our reactors. Uh, what is your reaction towards their reaction? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ma'am Susan, Sir Frank. She's a man reactor. Yeah, a couple of, a couple of points. Thank you, Frank. 
Yeah. A couple of points siguro. Uh, what Ma'am Susan mentioned about islands and that's certainly true. There are certain islands uh, in the Philippines that are still COVID-free and that includes Guimarães, which is part of Western Visayas and as you mentioned, Siquijor. Uh, but uh, remember, Singapore is also an island, but their cases have been increasing. I think there are a lot of factors that influence how COVID is trans yes. transmitted. Yeah. So in the Philippines, it's mainly because we have a lot of overseas Filipino workers and they keep coming home and this increases the transmission rate. Uh, New Zealand, yeah. Australia also has our islands and they have managed it to decrease to even zero. But because of incoming migration and other visitors that also uh, increase the transmission and some cases are, uh, the, case, the case numbers are going up. Uh, another point is the disaster. Uh, they always say that the Philippines is the 7-Eleven of disasters. Uh, name it, we have it. We have earthquakes, we have uh, storm surge, we have super typhoons, we have epidemics. Uh, in this case, typhoons actually are not mitigating factors. They contribute to the spread of infectious disease. Mm -hmm. For example, every time the rainy season, dengue and leptospirosis mm -hmm. also increase. Uh, we still don't know the effect on COVID, but of course the COVID uh, effect is heightened because most people mm -hmm. are now also susceptible to other uh, tropical infectious diseases like mm -hmm. this, like uh, dengue and the like. You know. So we have to watch out for uh, more uh, being cautious during this time of typhoons. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And an uh, 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 pang point siguro is because there's also a mindset within us uh, and I, I I, I call it the over COVIDization phenomenon. Mm -hmm. we, are so, mm -hmm. what is it? Uh, we are so caught up on COVID and everything mm -hmm. that's related to COVID, we forget that people are still dying of dengue, leptospirosis, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. heart disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so nakakalita mm -hmm. natin na magpapakuna sa bata dahil hindi mm -hmm. nadala sa health center kasi natatakot mm -hmm. magka-COVID. So they're more mm -hmm. likely to, to, to be sick of other diseases instead of COVID and that also increases or contributes to the, the how healthy the Philippines mm. is. And perhaps worrying itself could uh, yeah. attribute, could, could uh, contribute to such uh, disease or sickness. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, right, can so I share something? Uh, go um, on, uh, yeah, I, I had my thesis about trees huge trees about uh, one meter trunk diameter and i tested this and measured the effects of uh, temperature and humidity to a city I, so i tested four cities which are quezon city legaspi cebu and davao and these are all uh, species of acacia or samanea saman and uh, i found out that about uh, four degrees have been decreased by during summer just by sitting alone under a huge tree. I do not know perhaps species other than that, which is native, could actually contribute to the selection of among landscape architects or selection of a healthy trees or vitamin rich trees like malungay could be integrated in public spaces so that even those who are not able to buy uh, more expensive goods or vegetables in the market could harvest uh, this species and make it available for their mung bean or yung araw-araw nilang ulang. Is that also part of what has been researched globally or in terms of health and wellness, Dr. Padilla? Ah, yes, uh, that also contributes uh, very much to, for example, not only planting of trees around recreational parks, but also contributing to urban gardening. Uh, mm, so, uh, that's right. In, yes, in very highly dense uh, cities like New York, they do rooftop gardening in order mm -hmm. to make it greener and they can mm -hmm. harvest their food as well. Correct. Sa ano mo, sa gym mo, Frank? Pwede yes, rin ng mga herbs, di ba? Yes, ma'am. Um, ma'am, but um, mostly these are indoor plants. So I think they're, they're more of, uh, they have a certain limitations. No? But we, hopefully in the future, if we can make further researches about these, 
So hopefully we can specify all these plants. Na hopefully you know, I watched, I watched the African women. They were harvesting the malunggay in their uh, area. And then while they're harvest, kaya pala malulusog sila. Wala nangangain sila ng malunggay, raw, mm. and they chew it. And they, I found that the, the health of these women are... Ano, bukod sa sexy sila, no? healthy, sila. healthy sila, these African women who harvest them. Yeah. That's right. Yes. All right. Thank you all for your very insightful points. Okay, so I'm sure by now uh, our audience has lots of questions. And actually, I can see already in the comments, it's kind of brimming with uh, curious people. So uh, we can move on now to the Q&A, Sir Padilla. Sir Frank, Sir Ma, Dr. San, thank you so much for, the, you know, thank you. for your insights. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. OK, so Sir, Phil, Sir uh, Padilla, uh, Dr. Yes. Padilla, um, the, the first question is from Mr. Adrian Elog. Uh, can plants capture the virus, thus reducing the spread of the disease? Uh, right now, uh, there's no evidence that the COVID-19 can be uh, can infect plants. As of now, uh, only human beings. But there are anecdotal reports that some pets might be able to get the COVID-19 because remember the origin of COVID-19 are from bats. So it's definitely uh, an animal virus, and there's always the great possibility that it can be transmitted from animal to animal but right now there's no evidence that it is also able to infect plants all right yeah sir uh okay so the next question is from miss biuski peralta all right so with everyone scurrying for public space how well did we fare with inclusive designs in post-lockdown landscapes uh, he, she also noted that PWT ako and taking out ramps to make more space doesn't sit well with me. What do you have to say yeah. about that? <laughs> Sorry, I misunderstood it. I, I, I was referring to taking out ramps and placing it in another point so that more people can be accommodated. I did not advocate that it be taken totally. I, I removed it. I, I, I was just suggesting that it be moved to another place so that more people can accommodate that space, but uh, definitely uh, PWDs should have their ramps. Uh, in fact, I've been uh, pushing that because in Japan and the United States, uh, even their sidewalks are PWD friendly. So there are ramps here. In the Philippines, we are not very observant of that. Uh, sidewalks are elevated and people with disabilities have a hard time. Even pedestrian lanes in other countries like Japan and the US, uh, the it's not only light, uh, the, the stimulus is the change of light. It's not only the light, but also there's a tune, there's a sound for those who are blind. Uh, they can hear the sound, whether it's crossing or stop or go. So I, I think those all those are all very conducive for the PWDs. I see. Uh, okay, okay uh, thank you, uh, Biuski, for, uh, for that question. All right, so... Uh, for our next question, sir, uh, we have uh, Ms. Cora Tolentino with uh, this, uh, with the emphasis on social distancing when designing parks or open spaces. Do you think, think, do you think having more smaller local community parks will help to mitigate the spread of the virus? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I really agree with that. Uh, so uh, with my experience in other countries as well, uh, it's also in their law or in the local ordinance that they should reserve a particular space for parks within a certain uh, space or, or village in a particular area like in Japan. So in Japan, you can see various communities. Uh, there are parks everywhere because they are mandated by law to reserve those small pieces of land. Uh, Japan is uh, mainly mountainous, so open flat spaces are very rare. And yet they're able to, to construct this particular strategic small community parks that serves as a gathering, a recreational uh, place for communities that are living near that particular uh, area. Yeah, I agree. Yes, buddy. Okay. Thank you, Ma'am Ms. Cora, for your question. All right, on to the next one. 
All right, uh, here's a long one from Mr. Chino Reyes. All right, so pre-COVID trends in sustainable planning and design are partial towards compact development and creation of dense urban dwellings. Is there a direct correlation between urban density and susceptibility to pandemics such as COVID? In your opinion as a health professional, is this a trend that should change or evolve moving forward if we are to prioritize public health? And how can we strike a balance between environmental conservation versus sprawl and development if we were to coexist with these viruses? Okay, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, there's a very high correlation between density, especially in urban areas, and the spread of not only COVID, but also other uh, infectious diseases. So, for example, uh, TB is very high in squatter and informal sectors where there is very high density. Uh, it, it, and it's not only infectious disease, actually. Uh, other uh, non-communicable diseases like malnutrition, uh, obesity, etc., are also very high in these highly dense areas because, uh, as you know, they are also of low income and their environment is really uh, deplorable in terms of cleanliness and sanitation. Uh, how to coexist with the virus in this highly urban area. I think the solution there is really to decongest. So I am of the advocate that uh, other regions, aside from Metro Manila and Cebu, should be decongested and promotion of uh, other economic activities outside those particular regions would be very beneficial, not only in terms of economic inequality, but also in terms of producing a healthier health system, or not a healthier health system, but a better health system that will promote a healthy lifestyle among us Filipinos. Uh, the, uh, from the economic point of view, almost more than 50% of the economic activity are coming actually from Metro Manila, and all the other regions play a very a, a, a small role compared to the NCR. So if we are to uh, if we are to decongest Manila, we will also bring economic activity in the regions as well as promote clean air within the national capital region as well as uh, improve the health situation in these highly urbanized areas. I see. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, thank you to, for that uh, very, con uh, very detailed question. All right, uh, sir. Before we proceed with the next questions, uh, we forgot to do, we forgot to have you react to Sir Franklin's reactions earlier. I apologize um, for that, though. So, sir, so what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I totally agree that indoor plans and trying to uh, make uh, improvements in terms of bringing indoors the concept of bringing in greenery and plants, and uh, as I mentioned already. Uh, even the rooftops for urban gardening are really a very good idea in terms of climate change as well as promoting healthy lifestyle. I see. All right, sir. Uh, okay, well, before we proceed with the next questions, uh, I'll, yeah, I'd like to uh, no, uh, remind everyone that you can still ask your questions in the comments. So feel free. Uh, me, me, it's, on, it's very rare that we can get a, a steam a uh, person like Sir Padilla here. So uh, take, so strike while the iron is hot, I'd say. Uh, ask, ask any questions that you're really curious to know about. Anyway, so for the next question, it's by John J. Amar. But John G. Amar, uh, what are the best opportunities designers can interfere scientifically to society to mitigate both communicable and non-communicable diseases? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I think that's an area where designers and landscape artists, uh, landscape uh, architects can also contribute in terms of pushing for a design that is healthier and conducive to make more Filipinos healthy. Uh, for example, uh, that study of Mam Susan, for example, in looking at the decrease in the temperature depending upon the trunk of a particular tree species is very important. So, for example, uh, in designing parks, uh, how many trees are really needed in order to decrease the heat uh, that is generated by the concrete? Uh, uh, what types of plants uh, are more uh, uh, conducive in terms of health? Are certain species of plants promote aroma, for example? 
uh, will that uh, influence how uh, walkers or joggers breathe around the park? So those are, I think, topics, interesting research questions that should be explored, uh, not only by public health experts, but also uh, landscape architects as well. Right. Sir, ano, I have a question related to Mr. Amar's question because yeah. I believe, I think that as landscape architects, the designers of the urban space, I think we have to do more than just the directly mitigate, directly address the uh, virus, like, you know, uh, like, like, I, for example, I was thinking that instead that we could also use landscape architecture, uh, environmental graphics as a means of helping inform people, because as we know, uh, the prevalence of fake news and misinformation is really hin a hindrance to the the efforts to mitigate the virus so how do you what do you think about using landscape design to help uh spread uh information the correct type yes i hold the whole art uh really i wholeheartedly agree with that particular idea uh, i did not include it but there are some pictures or studies uh, not studies, but there are some local governments who employ signages, for example, that are uh, able to promote social distancing, uh, use of masks and hand washing that are integrated naturally uh, around the park or in other urban areas. Uh, I don't have the picture right now, but uh, I saw it last night while I was browsing and doing my research. So uh, it could really be uh, possible uh, to design the landscape or to design the natural environment in order to give out uh, information as well, not only in terms of designing it so that they are far apart because for social distancing, but also to remind people that these are the things that they should do in this time of the pandemic. I was also thinking, sir, that maybe we could use uh, environmental psychology. Like, for example, uh, pavement markings instead of being just decorative purely decorative could help uh give an idea of what the recommended distance social distance is like for example yeah. each each uh red pavers will be six feet apart something like that yes i agree all right uh okay uh, hello again uh sir frank and ma'am susan uh, i believe you're going to be plugging a few things Ah, okay. Uh, are we uh, sir, okay. first? All right. Um, so personally, uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Philip uh, Padilla for this um, very insightful talk on public health and how these can affect the way we use and design our open spaces, uh, particularly now that we are in this pandemic. Um, Mainly, I think my take on this is that we want our open space to be used and enjoyed by all. Uh, but because of the pandemic, everything is somehow put on hold. And I have a feeling that when we go out in hopefully in the near future, uh, we would experience our open spaces quite differently. Personally, um, what piqued my interest was the, this particular discussion on the use of plants. Uh, one question asked about if, if the plants can capture the virus or something like that. But uh, maybe we can use the plants uh, to enforce social distancing. Or yeah. maybe, yeah, in the future, we can select these plants that uh, perhaps would uh, encourage um, uh, a certain uh, ecologies to expand and grow. So hopefully the virus would be contained in the near future. Um, so when we watch the news or attend lectures that particularly deal with this matter, we tend to ask ourselves uh, what happened or why did it happen? Uh, these are questions that somehow we do not have any control on. What we can control is what we can do. So maybe we can ask ourselves what can we do? What can I do? Um, as a professional organization, actually the PALA has put a very high value on these health-related components and benefits of um, these public open spaces. As, our, as an organization, again, we ask, uh, what can we do? Um, like most recently, PALA 
Uh, they worked with a community through the help of the National Commission for the Culture and Arts in a project called Dundi Ang Pook, which just happened over the weekend. And our professional volunteers shared their knowledge and assistance in designing these patches of edible gardens. Um, with this alone, we envisioned the community to start going out, enjoying the sunlight, um, eat healthy produce, and socially relate with each other in the community while maintaining social distancing and, of course, um, hand-washing gestures. So next, as academician, uh, what can we do? Um, in the University of the Philippines College of Architecture, we open our doors with other units uh, through the research and extension program and the environmental landscape studio laboratory uh, to teach our students the significance of designing and managing our open spaces. Uh, we encourage our students to support health in their design. So hopefully in the future, we would be seeing more uh, design or design, space, design spaces that hopefully would see, foresee the future of another or hopefully not, but we will still be looking forward to, to future scenarios. So, um, so hopefully we can do that. No? Um, so again, we ask ourselves, what can we do? What can we do? Uh, maybe someday uh, this particular quotation called um, health is wealth. Yeah, maybe someday it will not be just something that we say when we're sick or like when we're in a pandemic. Maybe one day health is wealth will be something that we firmly believe in and embody. So once again, Dr. Padilla, we are very, very thankful and we also thank and more power to Pala for this type of webinars. And we hope that our viewers and listeners out there will be able to put what we have learned forward. So thank you for this chance to be your actor and let's all keep safe. All right. Thank you, Frank, for your second insights. Uh, I believe, uh, Doc Susan, you would like to give your, give your thoughts? Yes, good evening once again. And thank you very much, Frank. Thank you, Dr. Padilla and Taylor Balbi. I commend uh, Pala for hosting this uh, event, uh, um, second of the thir three. And there's, if there's something I would like to say, we have to find the intersection of professionals uh, in the field of design, like architects and, of course, landscape architects. And look at Ian McCarg's book on design with nature. Possibly there could be an answer there as what was described by Dr. Padilla. We also have to look at the intersect of professionals among health professionals uh, like doctors, nurses, health workers, and academics, uh, researchers in uh, the field of biology, microbiology, microbiology pathology, etc. And even uh, professionals in the field of music, heritage conservation, our teachers, our students, our biodiversity warriors. Uh, we have a project on biodiversity warriors with uh, a community here. We're training grades 9 to 11 uh, high school students in national uh, high schools, I mean public schools here in Los Baños. I mean, I've situated in Los Baños. And um, finding, and even with LGUs and, and the communities that we work here, are, we are subjected in. We don't have to go far. Uh, and um, uh, finding all the intersection of how we do collaborative work. I think because of this pandemic, while we have to have social distancing, our minds, our hearts, and our love for each other should be collaborative. Mm -hmm. Our efforts should be sharing. And that's the only way human is a race could actually uh, battle, win the battle against such a pandemonium of a magnitude of problem by being collaborative and finding the common intersection yeah. among us as professionals and even artisans or craftsmen of all levels. And of course, the politicians. I don't like to do politics here, but of course they have a very uh, crucial role in, in trying to 
uh, when they spend their time, their energy, our money, our resources, our taxpayers' resources. So it should be put into good use, into a collaborative effort altogether to fight pandemic and for the human race to win it. I think that's my message for the professionals and non-professionals listening tonight. Thank you right. very much, Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Sun. That was very inspiring. And I really agree with you with the fact that you also included uh, cultural stuff like uh, arts and yeah, because when we no, think I'm of science, sure. we think of health, we think of health, usually we discard these uh, non-empirical uh, fields, but to be honest, they're also important in being human and it also helps with wellness. Uh, am I right, Sir Frank? Because yeah. also it helps us uh, cope, especially now. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this COVID-19, uh, most of my time has been spent consuming uh, arts uh, like TV. Uh, correct. So it helped me. It helped me. It helped me cope with the uh, mentally with the threats of COVID-19. Not in addition to how physical distancing and other medical uh, protocols help me. Uh, physically protect me from the virus. Uh, sir, what are your thoughts on Doc Susan and Doc uh, and Sir Frank's uh, recent comments? Okay, thank you very much again, Ma'am Susan and Frank Baldi. Thank you for uh, the invitation, having to interact with Pala and having to share the view of public health to your professional organization. I think I'll uh, latch on to the message of Ma'am Susan about sectoral and interdisciplinary nature of how society works now. So it's not only us alone as public health uh, practitioners or landscape artists, I think we should collaborate. I think the interdisciplinary nature of issues now necessitates that we work together, uh, including culture and the arts. Uh, and uh, having said that, I think uh, we want to emphasize that in order to combat COVID-19, uh, it takes the whole society of it. It's not, it's also a personal responsibility, individual responsibility for each of us to observe the minimum public health standards like washing, mask, and social distancing. But also it's incumbent upon us to report our symptoms, to be in quarantine in order to protect others, not only ourselves, but others. So it's not only us as individuals, as Filipinos. And I agree with ma'am that I usually don't like the bad reputation of politicians, but the politicians are the ones that are uh, doing policy and doing the crucial decisions. And we need to help them. We need to work with them in order to improve uh, open spaces, recreation parks uh, for the healthy, for the promotion of the healthy lifestyle for a very, uh, Ang tinatawag ko niyan, healthier Philippines. Hashtag healthier Philippines. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Padilla. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, thank you, Sir Frank and Doc Susan. Okay. So, yeah, Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, ma'am. Have Goodbye, a sir. good night. Sleep. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Baldi. Uh, sir, sir, wait, Sir Padilla. Um, there are still more questions actually. Ah, there. <laughs> oh my, I'm medyo ano, medyo maligaling mga tao, which is nice. Okay, fine, fine. All right. So, uh, wait. Uh, I'm looking for that question. Uh, actually, first, uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, regarding sir. your recommendations regarding how to design okay. public parks, um, like for example, uh, how can we protect these amenities against theft, like? I guess he was referring to uh, to the hand sanitizers attached to the poles and the other the other new types of landscape furniture. Because after all, they don't come cheap, or even if they do, they're they're not exactly free. So who is willing to fund? How can we protect them against theft, damage, especially in these times where uh, people can tend to get a bit more desperate? What do you have to say about that, sir? Hello. Hello, sir Philip. Ah, I thought you were referring to Frank. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. Uh, this is more for you. Uh, ano, Leon? Uh, can you just recap? Uh, 
how can we protect uh, the amenities against theft? Uh, who will be willing to fund it? Because they're not exactly free, and people aren't exactly well. People people are kind of some people might be desperate. We can't blame them, but it will happen. How can we deal with that? How can we deal with theft? With, with uh, uh, yeah, theft. Uh, magnanakaw saan sa mga parks? Ganun ba yan? Yung, yung mga ano nyo? Yung mga, yung, the, your proposed uh, landscape furniture such as the uh, portable hand washing station? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah, now I understand. Uh, on top of my mind, there needs to be a, a lock or something that is permanent that easily be uh, removable so that uh, people will not be tempted to remove it. Uh, we still have to develop that particular mindset again, I emphasize that it's not all about you, it's about the community and it's about protecting the community. If you're going to steal that particular sanitizer or the toilet paper in the bathroom of a public toilet, then you're depriving somebody of his paraphernalia to be healthy and you're spreading germs and disease all over the place. So I, I guess the particular mindset that we have to think about uh, when we do implement this particular strategy. I see. Um, I believe uh, Sir Frank may, you know, Sir Frank has further insights with that. What do you have to say about that, sir? Well, usually design-oriented, these are design-oriented issues. So um, sometimes uh, when when we design these parks or these open spaces, um, we tend to not see this particular incident still in place. So um, I think um, there, are, there are certain design um, uh, mechanisms or that we can use. So for example, um, perhaps we can use um, plants that can uh, withstand, um, you know, a high volume of people in these public spaces, or perhaps we can use um, type of plants that are um, have a certain physical characteristic, characteristic like, for example, spiky leaves, so that they will not be, um, or that not they will deter. be prevented to, you know, to, to steal mm -hmm. all these. Uh, to deter um, them. Correct. So I think, and also there are certain materials that we can now use in 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 these outdoor spaces that are, are tend to be um, less theft prone or or vandal proof. So hopefully we could use all those uh, design interventions in in these public open spaces. Okay. And your thoughts, Dr. Susan? Yeah, my thoughts, it's funny eh. Kaya lang, I'll, see, I'll put a sign. Pag ninakaw mo to, magkaka-COVID ka or something like that. Di ba si Bayani Fernando, sinasabi niya, nakamamatay, wag tatawid dito. So, merong, you have to uh, work with the psyche of the audience or the target audience. If it's a European, iba yung style mo. Pag Pinoy, kailangan medyo gawin mong Tagalog kung nasa Bisaya ka, Bisayaan mo. You put something like that, you know. Uh, but that, but that's, that's just one of the many. Of course, uh, you can put camera. And you have to implement the yung, yung hidden cam or hindi na fake yun, totoo na yun. And you really have to really reinforce and reprimand. Huwag naman, ano, terroristic, no? Huwag naman over, ano, when the basis na you're caught in the act, then you have to be reprimanded reminded for that and that goes only for the level of the LGUs kasi kung maliliit na theft you 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 expect that in a country where people go hungry but if you give these people food they will not do that so mm -hmm. ang solution diyan hindi naman basta signage lang it has to be sabi ko nga systematized and collaborative with the efforts of even um uh, health workers trying to to preach this type of behavior because katulad sabi ni Dr. Padilla kung ikaw ay kinuha mo ito uh, hindi lang para sa iyo yan yan ay mawawalan din ng chance na ma-prevent yung pag uh, baka maaring pamilya mo magkasakit din so yung ganong teachings kasama yun ng mga health workers or barangay workers na pinipreach nila or tinuturo dun sa kanilang mismong barangay so you can approach that at the barangay level at the regional level, at 
uh, at a uh, national level and of course yung sa who yung global level so different levels different types of ways of attacking this petty or huge uh theft hmm. well said that's my take on it po. well said salamat po yes uh public uh, public health Gusto is ko lang a talaga sa <laughs> <laughs> well, we we did have good laugh, ma'am. And but but totoo yun, totoo. it's a very real. It is reality. It is a reality. Hmm. But toxicity is right. Uh, yes, public health is a major uh, proponent, yeah. major component of our current events. Uh, but we have to look at this from. We have to not miss the trees for the forest. We have to yeah. We have to not miss the forest for the trees. That's how the saying goes. Uh, so yes. Okay, so thank you, Doc Susan. Thank you, Sir Frank. Uh, so the next, I believe I'm going to read uh, some of the some more comments because I re some of these comments are really insightful, but you don't need to react to them. Uh, but I want I just want to highlight comments such as Ma'am Cecil uh, Tense. Uh, she says, "I think we have to rethink our design standards, which include our cultural habitats. It will also entail looking into how we work with the nature or the environment." The pandemic, this pandemic, will not be the last. I believe government has already picked up on this and will soon get greener building and environment-friendly laws and policies. Yes, so other, other comments such as with uh, Mr. Ilog, maybe we could focus on designing spaces to make the users healthier, thus increasing the natural defenses of our body against the virus. Okay. And again, with Bram Cecil's, uh, ah, yeah, I noticed this in the comments. Uh, they were having a bit of a debate uh, with regards to ramps. Um, Bram Cecil was saying that ramps don't need to disappear. They can be designed to be wider with handrails strategically located. So again, uh, it's never really, there's, it's never really with or without ramps. It, we can always jive them together. Anyway, uh, okay, so uh, are, are those all the questions? I mean, are those all the comments? Yes, I believe those are all the comments that we'd like to highlight. So again, uh, for reals this time, thank you, Dr. Susan. Thank you, Sir Frank, for your for being reactors to this uh, forum. All right, so uh, see, you, see you whenever. Uh, have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And Sir, Sir Padilla, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. So before we end this uh, this part two of the three part series, I'd like to uh, I'd like to remind you all that please uh, please fill out the feedback form uh, in the comment, which is posted in the comments, if you want to receive a certificate of participation. To add, uh, tomorrow will be the last uh, lecture of this webinar series. Uh, if you want to receive a certificate as well for that, you will pl please uh, pre-register, which is in the Facebook page of PALA, which is Philippine Association of Landscape Architects. All right. Uh, I would like to thank uh, I would like to thank the research and extension. Uh, yes, I would like to thank REX and also landscape. Uh, sorry. I would like to uh, thank Environmental uh, Landscape De uh, Design Studio. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to thank these, uh, the REX and EDSL. I would also like to thank the UP College of Architecture for your research and extension program. Sorry, I got mental. Uh, anyway. Thank you for you all for that. Uh, thank you most of all to our audience for staying with us until the end. And I re we re really enjoy and appreciate all your comments and questions. And we hope to see you all tomorrow for the last uh, third and final presentation uh, lecture of this series. Uh, for tomorrow, we will be having Dr. Michael Tan. Yes, that Michael Tan uh, discussing about uh, the social aspect of the uh, COVID-19 in relation to landscape architecture. Anyway, uh, I'm Balbi Santos once again, and see you all tomorrow. Have a good evening. <laughs>